Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the seventh episode of Sharing Management, Business and Personal Challenges from the Pandemic. Today, we're actually covering all three of those challenges. Uh, we're looking in a bit more depth at how you deliver services across frontiers, particularly when closed as a, manage as a business challenge. We're looking at how do you manage contracts and uh, suppliers and that sort of life. Um, spend analytics sometimes described as and we're also looking at the personal challenges for the leader and how do you uh, try and avoid interventions that create sort of panic and stress amongst your people so what comes next well the <clears throat> issues that we raised by 700 plus people now and some of you will have seen bits of this slide before if you're regular on the on the program but firstly we're looking at the whole area of continuity and scenario planning as the lockdown eases we're looking at strategies for communication through novel channels. We're looking at serving local and international clients in a social distance world. We're looking at winning mid to long-term business to sustain the workforce, financial management, billing WIP and collecting debtors, managing suppliers and contracts, and maintaining team productivity, morale, well-being, and personal resilience, cybersecurity, preserving reputation while making tough decisions. I think the two that I always like to come back to each week, because they really do matter, is firstly, are you rationing your time to create space for the real emergencies? It's incredibly easy to be busy, 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 but what happens when the real issue comes along? Have you got the time to deal with it? And finally, get everybody to realize that everyone needs some downtime, and that, of course, includes you as the leader. Uh, this is really a new thing I put in, so I thought it was quite interesting. I was on a think tank uh, get together, and one of the presenters was kind of giving me a few areas of what, what were their priorities. So I thought these really worked, and I thought really nicely. So, first of all, think big. Uh, anyone who's familiar with Alison Lewis Carroll believes six impossible things before breakfast. Well, I hope you had breakfast today, but that's certainly where I think you can go. You are the power of your connections, but always remember to reciprocate favors. Um, you know, doesn't work out. Think small. Think, think about the angles that actually resonate with your key audiences. Do a series, not a one-off. That way you convert an audience into a community. Drop convention. Go for new ideas and services. Remember, speed is of the essence, and this is really lean start. Articulate and market test your assumptions, and if they prove invalid, amend them and pivot in a new direction. And finally, be entrepreneurial. Keep listening and innovating. And lots of people think being entrepreneurial is about innovating. Actually, the listening is actually equally, if not more important, too. And thank you very much to Elena Kutsko of Globsec, who actually came up with those particular interesting priorities. So who's on today's panel? Uh, welcome back, Francesca, uh, who's the Global Lead Network of Capabilities of Grant Thornton. Today she says, I'm in my home patch because we're talking about international, which is very much her space. Uh, and welcome back also Jeremy, who's the managing partner of Hayes McIntyre and how his fortnight has been for those who, have, who are following his video diary. And then we have two new presenters, uh, Lucy Ride, who came in quickly, but is hopefully back in again this week. And James Cortis Pond, who is uh, the founder and CEO of Any Data Solutions, which is an, in, uh, an organization that helps with analytics and has a huge awareness of how data can be used to help management take better decisions. Sasha, who runs the Inclusive Group, which is, who looks at the whole area of diversity, inclusion, mental health, and how can the leader take those into account on the basis that an inclusive firm is a, is a, a well-led firm and a better firm, and of course, yours truly. Uh, before we go into the the, the regular poll. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting just to show you this one. This came out of last year's, last week's poll. And this is actually four questions combined, because one of the things government asked us to look into is, you know, how, to what extent, uh, well, how can we start relaxing restrictions on the lockdown? I know Boris is going to give us a plan next week, but we kind of said, well, let's, let's actually unwrap this. Let's understand what are the lockdown restrictions? And we've listed them at the bottom, travel bans, public gatherings, business premises, and maintaining a distance, which are the ones that really, really are onerous and which are the ones don't have much impact. And then we invited you across four questions last week, which is why it's quite difficult to give you the feedback then. Um, and this is really the result that we came up with. So unfortunately, there's no magic bullet other than maintaining possibly a distance of two meters but if public transport means that we can't go back to our offices anyway that one probably may be less important which is another way of thinking about it the other one that's trending on linkedin at the moment uh, are you informing all your people over the extent of reductions in partner drawings and director salaries and the fact was that that stage 25 percent of firms were not now i'm going to redo that poll again shortly not today but a little bit later and see if those if those percentages have changed so now really it's over to you um 
what we would say though is before that is if you are looking at any of those poll findings you'll find in the recently re um, released collaborative zone which obviously you're all aware of that uh, you'll find all those findings from all those polls in the top right corner so as a group where are we at um, a pivoter adapting the service proposition and working on new revenue streams is 42 um, percent and then there's a combination of hibernator at one level and Thriver at the other, and then Survivor comes between the two. So that's, that's as a group, we are pivoters. So I think in a way, those who actually take the time to join a session like this probably are going to be perhaps not as conservative as others, put it that way, if I may. Uh, what about the level of activity in your firm over the next year? Modest, modest contraction, that seems to be the, the, now that is very different from the tracker survey that we conducted three months ago. I'm going to be comparing those two for government because that is a massive difference from what was expected three months ago. That won't surprise you, I suspect. Um, what's happening on marketing? Again, about the same. Now there are people who have been arguing that marketing should be slashed in all directions. I don't think there are very many people who are increasing it, but about the same is, uh, is, is the highest individual item but of course if you group together all the reductions then you get a very different picture so uh, we'll, we'll we'll give you that information and some people it's more than 50 percent what proportion of new work typically comes from new clients about 10 to 15 percent um, so that means that across the sector about 10 to 15 percent of the new revenue is going to be or maybe in 15 to 20 now as people have been telling us consistently that finding new clients is a real struggle and then I think we're going to find that everything that that becomes a pretty big issue for management over the next month or so. New work, modest expansion, that's the expected still, um, but modest contraction is nearly the same number. Do you expect to expand the headcount? Modest contraction on the headcount, less good news for the, your workforce possibly there. And then in terms of priorities, um, again, altering the business for a new reality is number one. Now that is not the one that was previously the highest in other polls that we've done. It, typically that was about developing a clear purpose and strategy. So, so I think that again is, is definitely a change and that's quite a big 48% uh, put that as their top priority. Uh, social distancing, and this has changed from last time we looked at this, but uh, now given that people are saying that social distancing the workforce means we need more space and office workers therefore but office workers may be encouraged to work from home so actually about the same is now resurging and do they think that continued social distancing will impact ability to serve clients based in other countries and we may talk about that but very few people see that as positive no impact slightly about 50 percent but a modest but 45 percent see it as adverse and then finally are you planning to refocus your firm's CSR program? The maybe remain, the maybe is the largest one. So anyway, that's probably about enough from me. Uh, so I will stop sharing and I will now pass over to Francesca. Excellent, thank you very much, Richard. Interesting poll as always. Good morning, hope you're all well. Um, I'm gonna do a, a little update around international trade and then some of the things that have been going on this week. Um, funny enough, at this time of year, normally I'd be spending time with the member firms in our network who tend to be scattered all over the world. We've got about 140 of them. And we do regional meetings, uh, geographically clustered together uh, countries. We meet, we talk, we share, we set objectives. Um, and of course, we haven't been able to do any of that face to face. And it has been fascinating to do it all virtually. So this, this week, I've been uh, chatting to all our member firms in every part of the world all done on a, a sort of online uh, conference just like we're doing today it's been utterly utterly fascinating some really strong common themes coming out around international trade now um, obviously when we're working with clients we tend to work with our fellow member firms to service that client some people use um, other professional services in other countries if they haven't got offices there in other networks so I um, appreciate that many of you uh, are maybe working with other organizations outside your own, or you may be working with your own organization to deliver international trade, but the issues I think are pretty similar, however you're formed. Um, not a big surprise to see that credit risk is top of the list of everybody's issues. Are we going to get paid for the work we've done? Now it's a challenge wherever you are at the moment, it's all around cash management, not giving away 
uh, the, the finished piece of work to be sure you're going to get paid, and then talking and negotiating about whether any discounts are, are appropriate or necessary uh, to help everybody get the job done and make sure business keeps going. But clearly, when you're working across borders, you're operating within another environment. Huge important to manage credit risk and also just to have real awareness. Um, this is really ramped up with the government assistance packages that you've got around the world. Every government has done it differently. Uh, different ways, different ideas, different thoughts, some help for businesses, some other places doing very limited help. And actually a lot of the work that we're helping clients with at the moment is how to manage the government packages that are available as well. So that's quite interesting. But knowing what's going on, are there changes in duty, are there changes in quotas? Um, very helpful website, by the way, that the IMF put out uh, that just keeps a constant update on what's happening around the world. The shifting of the market is, is hugely problematic with international trade. You start off thinking you know where things are, things can move fast and things can move differently. Take, for example, if you're doing work in places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, or other places where the banking system has heavily looked down, it's much harder to get money out, much harder for trade to happen. Or other parts of the world where actually there's a release of a lockdown. As you may have seen Hong Kong and China have really released their lockdown in the last few weeks and trade has become a lot easier. Easier. Having that insight and that understanding of where the trends are going and it's moving so fast, you do need to keep um, quite, quite a close eye on it. And then the impact on your industries that you're working with, the client industries that you're in. Obviously, there's some pretty in distress industries at the moment, aviation, tourism being obvious ones, but also some that are booming, retail, uh, some forms of delivery, some forms of online services. But the pandemic, I think, has probably highlighted most of all how connected we actually all really are. We are just a Zoom call away or a Teams call away from connecting, but also how fragile international trade can be. One little item, one little slip can mean that things get a little bit more complicated. So keeping on top of that international trade, hugely important. So last one for me, Richard. It's all about communication. Communication with your end client, communication with anybody that you're working with to help service that client. You can't communicate enough at the moment to ensure that you really know all the facts, have all the information and can make the best possible decisions. Thank you, Richard. Fantastic. Very, very kind, Francesca. Um, I don't know how you managed to cover so much in such a short period. Uh, Jeremy, come and join us. And Jeremy, if you recall, uh, I mentioned is the, not just the managing partner of his own firm, uh, Hayes McIntyre, but also he is a director of MSI Global Alliance, which is a, a network of law and accountancy firms, unusually both law and accountancy. And so I thought it'd be interesting today, not just to have his little, little diary, but also to hear about how he is seeing uh, the which we might say that network are thriving or finding it tough in the current environment. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Richard. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is keeping well. So I'll just very briefly give a quick update on, on Hayes McIntyre and, and where we are, and then I'll perhaps look more at the international aspect. Um, we are increasingly trying to weave, I think is, is the right word, our, our business as usual uh, program into the current um, issues that we have to deal with as well. So we're getting back to um, standard meetings that we have, etc., cetera, to, to, to go through our standard agenda items and what have you. So, so that's been quite good in the last couple of weeks. I think my sense is that we've, we've settled down. We've got into a routine with regard to our working from home and the impact of the virus, etc., and we're starting to get back to, to, to a bit of business as usual, which is, which is great. Um, we're just going through really the, or just gone through the first month end um, uh, since we've been on, on lockdown. So that has been a focus of mine this last week to see where we were going to end up from a financial point of view for that first month. It's also our first month of the year. Um, so that's been there's been a lot of focus around that in the last week, and I'm pleased to say that that la that is looking pretty positive, um, and and long may that continue. But it is it is the first month, um, and, and we'll see um, we'll see how that progresses. Um, it, it's interesting. A, a couple of weeks ago, or probably ten days ago, less than two weeks ago, I, I was getting very concerned about our return to office and what that looked like, and 
definitely our director of ops and our ops partner were looking at that and have been looking at that in detail. And I'll come on to some conversations we've had at a, at a, at a UK level as well. Um, but that, that was a real focus. I think today it's less of a focus because my reflection at the moment, and I think there's very different reactions around different countries and different parts um, of the UK, but my feeling is now, even has changed significantly in the last week or so, is that it's going to be some time before there's a return to the office in London. Um, so I think probably less of a priority than it was even seven or ten days ago. But we're, we're, we're monitoring that and we are certainly um, working on our programmes and what that looks like to make sure we've got a, a, a robust plan. Um, as Richard said, I'm a director of MSI Global Alliance which is an international association of lawyers and accountants. We have um, about 250 firms in over 100 countries. We have been meeting regularly the um, UK and Ireland managing partners. And we, as I said, interestingly, have come back to the, the return to office point. We had a meeting um, last week and said, you know, this is really useful. Let's have another catch up. Should we catch up in two weeks time or a week's time? And we all said, no, we must catch up again next week because return to office is going to happen really quickly. And actually, when we caught up this week, um, it, there was a completely different view, as I say, slightly different views in different parts of the country. But um, certainly, I think that's the view in London. I think it will it will be interesting how it changes our operation uh, as an international association. I think there will be, we will get used to a lot more virtual communication, which I think will put pressure on our uh, physical meetings as, a, as an international organization where we've been very proud of, and it's been very important, important for us to have physical meetings around the world of different areas. I think, if that doesn't happen for a period of time and, and we've had to cancel some conferences already, then that will really start to put pressure on how we communicate um, with, with our associates. Um, and, I, and I think the, there could well be more communication, which I think is a real positive um, because we will get used to communicating virtually. But I think people will start to question the value of travel, time out of the office and, and, and that sort of thing for these for, for, for physical meetings, but we will see. Um, so in many ways, I think we have an opportunity to create better links between our members and our firms because we'll get more used to this type of communication. Um, of course, whether the demand is there from, from world trade and from our clients for, for cross-border advice remains to be seen. But um, I certainly see an opportunity for us to know member firms a lot better um, than, than simply meeting up once or twice a year at, at physical conferences. Um, so I think that's really where we are at the moment. So I'll hand over to, I think, James next. Yeah, no, that, that's really helpful, um, Jeremy. And as I said, uh, James is coming. We've now spent a little bit of time thinking about some of the business challenges of operating across frontiers. Uh, what we're now looking at, I think, is some of the management issues that management challenges that the pandemic has thrown up. And one of the ones which I actually believe very much is left often to the middle managers in the business groups. In other words, it's not just the CEO because at the end of the day, they tend to get too involved in supplier issues but actually it's up to the, the, the smart, thoughtful middle manager who then says, it would be really helpful if we were to dot, dot, dot. So James, on that thought, if I can pass over to you and hear your thoughts on. Thank you, Richard, and good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, in these five minutes, I'd really like to share four thoughts, uh, trends, process benefits that I'm seeing in the data and contract management analytics markets, particularly in these times. So thought number one, um, the current trend is all about cost reduction. Usually, as our name suggests, we service clients regarding any data set. So it can be strange stuff from airplane inventory, spare parts and analytics to the profitability of different size bottles in the retail um, sector from revenue to supply chains. But since COVID-19, I'd say 95% of all inquiries are about supplier base, supply chains and cost reduction. Um, and with so many organizations seeing revenues fall, sales pipelines on hold, 
taking on maybe additional debt, reducing drawings, or maybe even making redundancies. Analytics of a supply chain and looking at ways to find cost savings are a powerful weapon in the armory. And it's obvious to everybody on this call that it's all about finding savings opportunities to increase the bottom line. Uh, maybe sometimes up to 5% reduction in aggregate supplier costs is not uncommon. Thought number two, um, it's obvious, well, the contracts are actually little packages of unstructured data. It's obvious to your guests that the raw material for cost saving analytics is the data you have in your PMS system or your finance system or maybe some other applications. But each contract is actually a package of unstructured data. And if you can combine your spend data with your contract data, you can significantly boost the ability to identify exactly what an organization is spending in aggregate with all its suppliers, goods and services, who it's buying from, or what prices and all sorts of interesting other information. And from that, we can extract the insights for savings opportunities. And maybe very quickly, I'll just run over a couple of ideas that might uh, uh, resonate within your organization. Um, looking at spend data, smart categorization of spend data and procurement centric buckets of spend like travel, IT, I buildings, facilities, as opposed to finance centric chart of accounts, lets us whittle down the numbers of suppliers in a category from say 20 down to 10, resulting in better terms and prices. Um, interestingly, professional firms regularly see 75% of all invoices processed through the business are individually less than £1,000. So you can see a lot of high volume, low value spend, and that offers an opportunity for things like invoice, invoice consolidation, P card, uh, and each invoice removed from the system is reducing an end to end process cost of about £90. And even in the best run accounts payable departments, you'll be surprised, even in the best run, that you'll get a few duplicate payments going through the system each year, i.e. suppliers paid twice can sneak through the net. So with a bit of expert analytics, we recover those costs and uh, put a hole, um, fill in that gap in the AP process. Very quickly, a few insights from the contract management world. Why are they helping us look at more efficiency and um, cost savings? Well, remember, Small fortunes are really spent each year annually negotiating operational contracts, but the value won at that negotiating table can leak away very quickly if those contracts aren't centralized, shared and well managed. So some quick thoughts. OCR with the and smart, smart analytics can really quickly help us see things like how many contracts are we actually managing across the supply chain? It's rare that even in a small firm will be less than 100, usually a few hundred and in a reasonable medium sized firm, you could even get up to thousands. How many evergreen contracts have been running along without proper review? Maybe supplier invoices are still being paid when the full services has not been used for months or even years. Automatic renewals of annual contracts that could have been terminated or at least renegotiated with better pricing and service and compliance terms. Interesting question, how many contracts right now have got force majeure provisions that could be activated, but you don't know about it? Which member of your organization is specifically responsible to maximize the supplier contract relationships? Now, interesting, pre-pandemic, actually, we saw a huge priority was on compliance, which do we have the right um, anti-slavery, anti-bribery uh, lease uh, obligations or uh, modern slavery in our contracts? But at the moment, to be honest, that's not quite such a priority, but I think it's important and we still need to get the, that sort of part of the house in order as well. Thought number three. Um, to encourage your business teams to push the use of smart analytics. I think as Richard was saying, typically heads of procurement, heads of IT, facilities managers, etc., heads of uh, employment, even our HR, are looking to, for tools to unlock the value to help the firm. Um, siloed data sets and a few spreadsheets and a bit of Power BI typically doesn't unlock this door. So firm-wide leadership might consider encouraging its business managers if they are looking for sort of smart contract management and analytic services. And finally, thought number four. It's not just about savings, it's also about maximizing efficiency as more people work from home as we've just been talking about. I think this trend may continue obviously post lockdown as we see that uh, these established working practices have been disrupted or heaven forbid we have further waves. Um, but the point is the cloud-based solutions enable cross-departmental teams to interrogate information and collaborate, well, collaborate while it's working securely from home. Mike Ryan is a client of ours, head of procurement at facilities uh, at Slaughter and Mate, and he said to me on a call last week, and happy was for me to share, he said, your contract management application is one of the three most important applications in the firm at this moment. And he said, it's not just about the insights, it's about the access for everybody to be able to work from home with the instant access for the information. So I hope those sort of insights might be uh, getting the cognitive juices flowing. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, James. Uh, we'll go on to uh, Sasha now and then uh, come back to Lucy, if I may, after that and hear government's take and uh, any specific issues that she'd like to raise. Um, so over to you, Sasha. Thank you very much indeed. And equally uh, conveying everyone's sentiments, I hope everyone's OK. Um, so I wanted to um, get, get us thinking about inclusion and diversity within this COVID environment from a leadership perspective and I'd like, um, I'd like you to be thinking about actually what happens to inclusion and inclusive leadership in such a crisis and actually I think that given the isolation and given the fragmentation of the workplace there is a very strong argument that we need to be focusing as leaders on inclusion more so now than ever. Um, often when working with law firms, and we work with a lot of law firms, probably over 35, you know, there is um, a mixed sentiment about the importance of diversity and inclusion. Um, and that, that maybe it's more of a reactive rather than a preemptive approach in terms of the drivers behind this. But if we focus on one of the key drivers around inclusion um, for organizations, it's very much about obviously people. And as Richard said at the front end, it's about actually understanding what the people want who work for you at the moment by listening. So when we look at the techniques that um, organizations are, you know, are embracing and should be thinking and focusing about in this fragmented world, one of those key things is, actually at a very senior level, how do we come across as leaders? What are you in terms of listening to our people? And one of the things that I've seen going on in the last five weeks within professional services, which is really, really successful from a senior leadership perspective, is the humanization of the storytelling um, in terms of how is this for me? So in a way, if you reflect on to that really classic clip that happened when the BBC reporter in Hong Kong was to giving um, a report on something in his front room and his children sort of gate crashed the, uh, the meeting and came in and that went completely viral. One of the interesting things about that was the slight humanization of here was a BBC reporter, but here were his children as well. And what I'm thinking and seeing quite a lot of is senior leaders humanizing their stories that we're all in this together. Uh, we're not all in the same boat and the diversity elements of COVID are quite fascinating from a demography perspective. But we're definitely, when we're looking at techniques to reach and to connect with people who work for the organizations, the, uh, the authenticity at the top in terms of recognizing this is really this is really tough and not easy, I think it you know, really helps in sort of increase the inclusion. So that's one thing to be thinking of. But again, it has to be done in a very kind of authentic way. The second thing that we're seeing um, leaders embrace and then to pass through like osmosis is getting better at listening to people within the organization within the firm in terms of how is it for you so we've seen an increase of um pulse surveys the the getting under the skin in terms of what what's going on and how are people feeling and one of the key things coming out from that over this week has been mental health mental wellness and a huge anxiety about returning to work what does that look like? What, that, what is that going to do to my time in terms of a huge commute? When I get to work, what's that going to mean about PPE? How are we going to operate in an office environment? And a very mixed sentiment that I'm hearing in terms of an anxiety of coming back to work and are, is my employer listening to that? So that's one, one thing to be aware of. The other thing to be very aware of is the impact of unconscious bias. So a command and control um, sort of uh, immediate form of leadership is not going to necessarily help because actually when we're in that panic mode, our unconscious biases are triggered dramatically. And there is um, a bias that people are talking a lot about at the moment, which is the digital presenteeism bias. Am I as a leader more connected to people that seem to be on all of the time? And yet actually if I'm, you know, senior associate or, or whatever in in a firm and I've got childcare responsibilities or elder care responsibility, I can't be on all the time. So there would have to be differences. So one of the key takeaways from today is 
empathy, how empathic am I as a leader? How well do, am I actually authentically listening to people? And instead of treat people how you'd like to be treated, I would challenge you to turn that on its head and treat people how they want to be treated. So again, that human connection, that awareness of uh, mental, uh, mental health and wellness being a key priority for people within the organization. And finally, the approachability, humanize, oops, sorry, that's obviously me at the end, um, humanizing workplaces through just being an authentic leader, again, will help charge the inclusion that is so necessary given times of isolation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sasha. I'm sure we'll come back to them, some of those points in the panel session. Um, Lucy, uh, welcome as always. I don't know if you'd like to give us a quick update on, on government and any thoughts you have on issues raised today. Uh, that would be really helpful. I'm going to speak a little bit about um, the international guidance available online um, and that you can reach out and make great use of at the moment. Um, and then just provide a quick update about um, government support schemes that have come out this week. Um, so first of all, the Department of International Trade, obviously that's their remit. Um, there's some great guidance that's updated regularly and you can access bespoke guidance, um, which, which is quite rare. Um, and it's, it's a really rich resource. So they can advise on a variety of aspects from intellectual property, um, issues with business continuity um, in terms of COVID-19, expanding market opportunities whilst we're in the situation um, and managing your online presence to name a few. Um, so you can access the support through um, finding your local trade office in the UK. Um, obviously, if you have existing um, international trade advisor relationships, I recommend going there first. Um, or for UK businesses overseas um, with ongoing projects um, that may have been disrupted by COVID-19, um, they do have worldwide CIT offices. Um, so that's great where um, you're in countries where there may be more severe lockdowns of um, banks um, and a bit less support. Um, what I'll do, if I may, Richard, is I'll put a few links um, in the chat after I finish speaking. Um, and in terms of finance, um, the UK export finance, they can help businesses facing disruption at the moment. Um, so they have a specific finance and insurance supported for exporters that are affected during COVID-19. Um, all this advice and guidance is just a call away. Um, so it's easier than ever to get their advice um, due to the remote capabilities. Um, so I'd really encourage the use of these support services. Um, in terms of updating on government support schemes, um, you may have heard on Monday our ch Chancellor announced the Bounce Back Loan Scheme, um, which is um, more relevant for small and medium enterprises. Um, the service will be available on Monday um, and you can apply online um, with a short and simple form. So um, it's a lot, lot speedier, a lot quicker um, than some of the other support available. Um, and quite a contentious point, the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme, civil, um, the government's taking additional steps to make accessing the scheme easier. Um, including removing the per lender portfolio cap for government guarantee and changing the viability test. Um, I know there's been um, real issues, particularly for medium enterprises, um, on accessing this loan. Um, and lastly, next steps. Um, our policy is led by you, business, um, and we're really appreciative of this great forum, Richard, um, and that we're able to access so many businesses. Um, so please feedback if you feel that we're missing something. Um, I, I can't guarantee um, that I can give a direct response now, but it's, some, it's things I will certainly take away. Um, but yeah, thank you, Richard. Well, that's thanks, Lucy. And one of the things that uh, you may be aware of, those of who actually looked at the Collaborative Zone, is that we've now put into it uh, all the issues that uh, you put, we put forward on your behalf to Lucy and they have responded. Uh, and that's not just Lucy writing, I know it's the cross bays. And we've also uh, gone through and sort of summarized very well, brought together all the various bits in the, the daily bulletins into one wiki that you can access, all of which is government. The only slight health warning is it's got a date and that's the date which was accurate. And as Lucy's just mentioned, some of these schemes are still fluid in aspects of, so things may change. So do check on the government website if you're th before you actually do anything, but it's as a quick, it's quite useful to have it all there. So thank you, Lucy, for that. We will hopefully continue to 
pass issues on on concern of our, of the very much the mid market which as government has always found is often the hardest to tap into because mid market leaders are all very busy doing their own uh, business they haven't got time to hire head of corporate affairs or involved in those sort of things and unlike micro organizations they don't have uni universities or others sort of um, micro testing them the whole time to see how they're getting on so so we're really pleased to be able to make our contribution through this community right we've got about 15 minutes now and what I'd like to do if I may is to encourage you to use the Q&A um, which is on your uh, screen uh, towards the bottom. We've got a couple of questions which have come in. I know that there was one that came into Sasha. Perhaps you'd like to deal with Tim's question first and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so, um, so Tim was asking about inclusion. Will inclusion initiatives change um, after, after this crisis abates? And I'm, well, obviously I'm biased, but I don't think they will change. I think they will uh, iterate slightly, um, but I think generally speaking, uh, you know what people are never going to work the same way and we've certainly got a lot of clients looking at their leases with a view to changing those completely and creating more localized hubs rather than having to commute into London etc so I think inclusion is going to be very much a key thing because it's embedded in culture and it's embedded in how do we connect with people who work in different ways because we are seeing a seismic shift in working from home and it's like the biggest unplanned work experiment that's ever happened and there are certainly lots of people that are desperate to get back to the office but i know so many people anecdotally that um are really wary or are feeling they're much more productive by working in different ways so inclusion will absolutely be up there but i think it will sit quite neatly under esg and see it being seen as slightly broader in that perspective yeah, the, the fascinating thing about this um, sort of unintended experiment that we're going through uh, is just how much uh, people have liked working from home. Um, I appreciate that some people haven't, but there's a huge number who have. And what's intriguing is how many people are saying, I don't want to go back to working five days a week in an office, in a busy city, if that was their life. And I don't want to be going on the train. I don't want to be going on the tube. I don't want to be going on the metro. I, I want to work differently. And who knew it's actually driven more diversity and inclusion because people like to have that flexible working. And I you know sort of thing that, they, you know, my, I've, I've worked now for, obviously I started very, very young. Uh, I've worked for about 30 years. Um, and I know that if I had to flexible working, I would absolutely not be able to do the job I do today. I'd have had to have changed my career path considerably. So something here that we really need to make sure we don't lose, because if we are truly intent on making uh, diversity and inclusion part of our future thinking, we need to look at the lessons that we've just had. And those people who've invested um, heavily in trying to make the work, work space better are going, well, actually, what our people are telling us is they don't necessarily want to come into the workspace every single day. So a lot to learn from it, I think. I think that's also particularly true when it comes to the people in the business services roles, because uh, the idea of your finance team being sort of spread across the countryside perhaps would have been impossible, whereas many frontline advisors would be going out and seeing clients and being much more mobile and you know, audit world probably you don't have enough desks for all the people in an audit team because you want them out of clients, not sitting in the office. Um, so, but I think it's really the business services teams, whether it's marketing, finance, HR tech, the usual mix, they're the ones who really see the change and do we need really expensive office accommodation for for them given what you've just said francesca so absolutely um mike's come in with a question now regarding essentially practical imperatives i think it's really for the panel as a whole on this one uh jeremy perhaps you'd like to uh, kick off on this question from mike around um to what extent are we now focusing on the practical imperatives of work and cash as the lockdown appears to be extending mike over to you Okay, thanks, Richard. Um, I think the answer to that is, is yes, absolutely. We're still in a period, that whilst it's settled down, I think, over the last few weeks, I think we're still in a period of great uncertainty. And, uh, um, you, you know, we have to be mindful of that. And none of us know how things are going to map out. So, absolutely, we, it is key that we are, we are monitoring uh, our, our workloads and our cash flow uh, daily, really, I, I I have visibility of that to see um, what we refer to as inputs. Utilization is amongst the staff, and, and what cash is coming in on a daily basis. And, and and so far, that is pretty good. But of course, as I say, we're we're still in very much uncertain times. 
uh, our, our clients to an extent are being supported by government initiatives and how long will they last and therefore you, you know what will happen after that i know a lot of industries are, are very fearful almost of of going back to work in in many respects because they could suddenly have a lot of the government initiatives withdrawn um, but only 30, 40, 50 percent of their income that they previously had. So, so that that makes a very different proposition. So, um, absolutely, Mike. The 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 focus is on 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 workflow and and cash flow. Lucy, can I just pick up the point that uh, Jeremy was making around? Uh, it's a bit like in Germany at the moment. I think where a bunch of where a lot of shops have now opened, so they don't get support, but nobody's going shopping <laughs> because they're scared. So actually, the shop is worse off than when they were being furloughed. Do you have any thoughts? I appreciate it. government doesn't know the answer, but sort of where the thinking might yeah. be in terms of um, adapting so for that period. Of course, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, that's where our thinking has been at um, for the last kind of two weeks. Um, we're really kind of pondering this question um, and what support we can provide businesses when we do return to the new normal. Um, I don't have the answer for you yet um, and the bounce back scheme that I was referring to that's kind of one initiative um, of many that will hopefully be coming out um, so the bounce back scheme will be available on Monday you can access up to 50,000 12 months interest free no um, fees um, so I think we'll be looking at initiatives um, with support for a lot longer um, after lockdown's finished um, but I'm, I'm sorry I can't give any kind of precise details at, at present well, one sense is that lockdown is going to be almost like a spectrum, isn't it? Where it will be yeah. a little bit here, test, 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 a little bit here, test, test, test. Yeah. Okay, uh, this one from Mike again. Do you want to just quickly talk through this one, which, if you recall, was looking at how can you humanise the DNI balance during COVID? Uh, Francesca, do you have any thoughts on that one in terms of the uh, yeah, sure. Tips on how to humanise DNI. Yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame Sasha's not because I think she would be absolutely spot on in this. But humanising to diversity and inclusion. I'm, I'm, I'm hope I'm understanding the qu the uh, question correctly. But I'm, I'm taking that as uh, given the the extreme conditions that everybody's having to work under. Um, how do you make sure we haven't got a clunky DNI program as opposed to something that really feels alive and special uh, for the moment we're in. And I think that's the issue with um, any kind of initiative where you're trying to drive behavioral change. You've got to be very alive to how is it landing? Is it really just something that looks like an initiative uh, that someone's dreamt up on the back of a piece of paper? Or is it something that's really about um, behavioral change? And behavioral change, of course, is the hardest thing to do. So I think there's a piece there, but um, from the management level, showing it's about really caring, really trying to do the right by people, um, sometimes putting people uh, really high up your agenda before profits, and also, of course, making sure that any initiative is something that is truly bought into and isn't just going to fade away um, alongside any lockdown. So um, I think it's about being true, being authentic, having something that the leadership not only believe in, but actually role model uh, as well. Um, and as we know from many, many previous examples of DNI programs that have failed, um, the ones that are just a program tend not to do very well. The ones that are really inbuilt, and there's some great examples of people truly changing the way they work, truly embracing it, really making it possible. Um, those are the ones that tend to survive. So um, it's a great question, uh, and but not an easy thing uh, for, for any organization to do unless they really fully embrace it. Thanks very much, Francesca. Jeremy, do you have any thoughts on um, the importance to management of diversity and inclusion as a, an approach to the way you manage your workforce? Yeah, I mean, it, it remains hugely important. And I, and I think, as was mentioned earlier, I think the way in which we're working at the moment will will, will, will naturally lead to more diversity and inclusion. Um, but but yeah it remains it remains crucial for us and probably um as the way in which we operate changes in the future will become more and more important thanks um james i'd like to sort of bring you in if i may um obviously what your sort of old harry on contract I mean, I'm, I'm quite curious as to exactly once you've got this um what do you call these bits of data this data set which is what these contracts are that you are 
um, looking into it. What, what exactly what exactly is happening in the box? What exactly are you pulling out that will help management manage? Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, well, as we were mentioning earlier, there's kind of two angles to it. There's the contract management side and the data side, but of course, contracts are packages of data. So the things we're looking to do is first and foremost, ensure that we actually get uh, the full spectrum of the contracts into a centralized repository so you can find them. Uh, that's the first piece because otherwise they're just stuck in people's hard drives or in SharePoint or, you know, maybe on hard copy somewhere. But once you get hold of them, we're looking to extract the kind of information that can help us to manage them better, essentially. So to work out exactly uh, who the suppliers are, what goods and services we're buying from them, um, what prices we're paying, benchmarking those prices against potentially cheaper prices if we look for different options. Um, and uh, just essentially making sure we extract the full amount of value. But secondly, making sure that those contracts, when they're done, don't keep continuing. Um, they naturally have a, a rollover period. They come to an end. And we want to make sure that it's an opportunity as every contract comes to a close that you can pick up the phone to somebody and say, we've had a really good relationship. We'd like to continue it. But in the current circumstances, we need a, a price reduction. Uh, we might also want to update our compliance clauses and get ourselves with modern slavery and anti-bribery up to date. Um, or it might just be uh, an, a negotiation or it might be time to say goodbye. Um, so it's trying to pull out those kind of insights from the contracts that we're looking at high level. Thanks very much. Uh, Jeremy, do you have any thoughts on this sort of contract management space? Is that something that crosses your desk as the CEO or is that something that you would look to others to manage on your behalf? No, that, that, that would normally sit with our, with our director of ops. I have to say we're probably, we're probably uh, not as good as we should be in that area. And I've certainly taken some, some notes from comments that James has made. Uh, to, to to follow up on um, so so yeah nothing nothing I'm afraid constructive to particularly add. Uh, Francesca, any thoughts on this area of managing your contracts? Sort of hidden oh, avalanche I thought, of. Oh, I thought that's great insight from James there, um, and also it's about that constant review of how you do business, isn't it? And what what's perhaps been a, an, an interesting side effect of the pandemic is you've had a little bit more time. Uh, to look at some of these issues because efficiency is raised so far up the schedule. Um, I was chatting to someone today and they were saying they've never had such good management data. They've never had people filling in their utilisation so clearly. Um, they actually know much more over their financial information because people have had a bit of breathing space to think about it and it's become so heightened in a cash environment. So um, there's another thing to take out of the pandemic. Awesome. Okay. Um, what I'm kind of also quite interested to find out is what the panel's priorities might be for the next week and where your area of focus is going to be. Um, James, tell us about what you're looking to spend most of your time on over the next week, other than serving clients, that's a given. Yeah, other than the serving client stuff, um, we are focused on uh, marketing. Uh, making sure that we uh, can get, push our message out to the world and see if we can help people where they need some help around these, these areas. That's a big push for us. So we're still doing quite a work, bit of work on social media marketing uh, uh, and product development. Um, uh, and of course, keeping a tight rein on exactly what's going on through the cash flow and everything else. I mean, it's probably a pretty similar story to most people who are listening or on the panel today, I would imagine. Yep. Uh, Jeremy, what about what are your sort of areas of focus over the next week or so? Yeah, I, I, I agree with James that, you know, cash and cash and utilisation key. I, I suppose probably um, what, what's right up there at the moment is is, is picking up communication again um, with, with, our, with our staff. It's it's 10 days since we did an all firm briefing. I'm, I'm very conscious that there's been a lot of noise around return to office, et cetera, et cetera. And I suspect that, and, and has been mentioned on, the, on, on, on this call today, a lot of anxiety. So I think we're gonna do a, a, a survey of our staff within the next um, few working days, and then to feed back on that and, and to, to sort of reassure the staff with regard to our position on, on return to office. But as I said earlier, I don't think it's gonna happen anytime soon, but I do think there's, there's a piece of work for us to do in, in that area to get everyone comfortable and um, not, not, not unduly concerned. 
Uh, Lucy, why don't I ask you, what, what, what do you think, you, I mean, given you sit in a completely different space to anybody else on the call pretty much, what are you going to be likely to you think your priorities over the next week or so? Give us a steer. Um, so from a personal perspective or from a work perspective? Um, well, I think you're more from a sort of business, from a sort of your role within Bayes and, and the sort of yeah, elements. So, that, to the extent you can talk, I appreciate some of this stuff is confidential, but just sort of a sense yeah. as to where, how are the civil servants, if I can use that generic term, how they focus to help move things forward in a positive way in the current environment? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think for us, it, we are starting to think, right, well, our department certainly um, is starting to think about next steps and kind of how we can support businesses post lockdown, um, where, whenever that may be, um, just so we're kind of up ready to hit the ground running. Um, from a business perspective, um, so we all, uh, we're very privileged in our department to be able to work remotely. Um, so I think we're, we're gonna be kind of stuck in the home office for a while. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, definitely next steps, um, how we can support businesses. And I mean, we're kind of going through a new shift. So um, our, our focus has, um, changed dramatically. Um, before this, I was working on a sector deal, um, a PBS sector deal, um, with a lot of kind of um, projects that were were going to be face to face. Now we're having to rethink how can we do that remotely? How can we um, how can we expand across the regions um, in the in this space? Um, so I, I think we're 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 at a similar a similar point um, to the rest to the rest of the panelists and the rest of the businesses here. Uh, we're all dealing with uncertainty, I guess. Uh, Francesco, yeah, we'd yeah. perhaps like to sort of wrap it up for us and uh, tell us what you have in mind for the next week or so. Oh, it all sounds so similar to everybody else. Uh, lots and lots and lots of looking to the future, planning, planning ahead, uh, trying to make sure we're in good shape if lockdown does lift and it's lifting in some part of the world. So uh, learning from the firms where it has. And then um, I sit on our global leadership team and we've got a meeting this week and uh, we'll be talking about lots of things where the, the future uh, feels like a couple of weeks away. So we're gonna be looking at all sorts of elements uh, around business and what the new normal really is. Yeah, well, I'm gonna be in the garden this weekend and doing the usual stuff. And what, what, are, what are the other panel members gonna be doing in their, their spare time, um, their, their home time, their personal time? But let's just quick round. How about you, James? Well, I didn't realize that we were fellow um, vegetable growers. So yeah, I actually love, I think I got it from my granddad. So I have a real uh, way of relaxing. Like I love going outside and trying to do a bit of vegetable growing, but mainly, of course, um, in this lockdown environment, I have three kids and uh, I'll be uh, doing the best I can to be a good dad for them and have some fun. Jeremy, how about you? Yeah, I, I, I need to get some fitness work in rather late in the day, but I'm very excited that uh, as, as a team, Hayes McIntyre are all doing uh, an hour's exercise next Wednesday uh, with the objective of trying to get from Land's End to John O'Groats. So we've got to go as far as we can in an hour. Um, and that will be recorded on our internet and it's a, a big fundraising opportunity as well, but a great opportunity to get the whole team together next week. Um, so I need to get some late fitness in, I'm afraid. Lucy, how about you? Uh, that's a great idea, Jeremy. Um, so ironically, um, we recently relocated to London um, to shorten our commute. <laughs> um, so I'm busy kind of unpacking lots of boxes, keeping me busy, um, and also um, spending time with my dog. Um, we've got a little rescue dog, so <laughs> he keeps us busy. Brilliant. Francesca, your, your time off. Do you, do you have some, I hope? Yeah, well, I, I have uh, three, three children, all of whom are back from university. Uh, so I have five adults in the house. So we've been doing uh, a rotation of board nights and movie nights and, uh, and some fitness. Not as exciting as Jeremy, as I hasten to add. Uh, so big quiz on Saturday, family quiz. Looking forward to that. Excellent. Right. Well, look, I'm going to now just quickly wrap up because I think we're just about at that time. So uh, thank you all very much for your joining us today. So for those of you who haven't yet visited the Management Library, uh, you'll find all the videos are there for not just this series of Staring Challenges, but also from hearing from experts. Uh, the next one of which is next Wednesday, the 6th of May, and we've got an executive coach who's talking about how can you adopt a coaching mindset when leading your firm. And he was a CEO 10 years ago. He's now executive coach. He's talking a bit about the journey that he went through and some of the things that he learned along the way. I'd like to quickly leave this thought with you. Uh, this is a quote that 
one of the viewers came up with, um, this is not somebody actually I know, thank you, Nikki, um, but I just thought that was something that, um, well, it certainly made my week anyway, just getting this completely unprompted from somebody. So thank you, Nikki. And um, obviously I will now be uh, looking forward to earning your uh, support into the future as if indeed we are offering compulsive being, then that's quite a hard act to follow as they say. Um, but I hope you found today valuable and please recommend your peers to sign up at that usual number. Uh, the usual address if they're interested for what will be episode eight next week and it's on Thursday not on Friday because as you'll probably be aware VE day is on the Friday uh, Maybank holidays so we're running on the Thursday and we've got some quite interesting people coming in as always and hopefully we'll see you and have a wonderful weekend in the meantime bye for now